Well, good afternoon, Family Voice listeners. My name is Daryl Budge. I'm the WAS Track Director for Family Voice Australia. And I'm joined today by Dr. Sheila Nathan. It's wonderful to have you here with us. Thank you for Thank having you, me Sheila. the opportunity to talk. Yeah, so Sheila is actually the Executive Director of Coram Deo Classical School, and she's also a pioneer of a micro school network here in WA. We'll be talking today about, of course, our classical Christian education, what makes a good education in general, and what makes a Christian, what can a classical curriculum offer to students? So today we'll just go through some of those things. And uh, we're joined today also by Andrew McCall, who's going to be here um, answering questions from our audience today. So welcome everybody who's on the call and uh, direct your questions in the Q&A box down below. And um, we'll get started with a few questions with Dr. Sheila and um, then we'll um, keep going. So. Uh, Let's, let's, let's get going. So tell us a bit about your background, uh, Sheila. Tell us about where you came from and sure. you just introduce yourself. Sure. So I was uh, born in Malaysia, um, three, four generations in Malaysia from South India. Um, came to Australia when I was just about 17. Um, so all our children and our grandchildren have all been born here in Australia. Mm, all right. So you've had a, a pretty uh, solid background and you've, uh, you've always been a Christian. You came to, to Christian faith for the uh, yes. middle, middle, in, middle in life. Yeah. So um, from a Christian family, yeah. um, but came to a point when I was about 18 when I knew I had to make a choice whether to live for God or to live for <clears> myself. Yeah. So I had both a good Christian upbringing and a conversion experience. Right. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So... Tell us a bit about then about your training and how you became to come become aware of classical Christian education. Sure. And tell us a bit about the findings from your doctoral research. Okay. So I did uh, my primary and my secondary education in Malaysia. Um, and we didn't know any different. We thought there was only one curriculum and you didn't have a choice about it. So I went to... Um, Actually, I went to a Catholic school, Catholic girls school, but they could only use the national curriculum. So then I came to Australia and I actually came and I did an accountancy course, uh, qualified as an accountant. Um, but then I uh, discovered that I quite liked teaching, although I had avoided it be, because lots of family members were teachers. Um, enjoyed teaching and then started teaching, uh, not knowing that I had a choice about what to teach and where to teach. So I have spent uh, nearly 30 years teaching um, and I've taught in state schools, primary schools, secondary schools, various subjects. Um, and when I was teaching at a Christian school and it was in leadership, I'd attended a Christian teachers conference and this question came up. We talk a lot about Christian worldview. We talk a lot about what a great impact it has on students, but where is the evidence? And that got me thinking that I should do something about it. So I went and did my doctorate. Um, and the title of my study was, how has a Christian school helped in the Christian formation of the students? The uh, perspective of the students, their parents and the teachers. Um, and it was really quite different to what I expected the results to be. Um, the students, Although the school was talking about developing a Christian worldview, the students weren't talking about that sort of lingo. They were talking about, oh, you know, when we did uh, devotions with our teachers uh, and they were so kind and they prayed with us and we went on mission trips. Those were the sort of things that they thought of that had helped their Christian formation. Then we have parents and parents told me exactly what was in the school website. Um, I should say the participants were all year 12 students who had been at the secondary school their whole secondary life. So these parents of year 12 had no idea what was really happening. All they knew was what the school said and from the website. And then um, in talking to the teachers, 
they gave us a variety of answers. Some of them really did say that they were trying to teach from a Christian worldview. Others said it was too difficult. Um, so there was no cohesion in what they were trying to do. So Christian schools using the national curriculum say that they can help their teachers to teach from a Christian worldview, but my evidence didn't show that. Yes, but as I was journeying along, I came across this thing called a classical Christian education. Yeah, so we'll need to explore what that model is in a bit more depth now. Um, so you you became you, you became a teacher. So you went out and, and did the normal Christian education thing after that, mm -hmm. or before that actually. Um, um, so tell us about your experiences and how you became dissatisfied with the current models of, of education. Okay, so I. Um, just taught what I was supposed to do okay um, and I think what I found was when students were in my class and I was a secondary teacher they were doing what they want what, what I wanted them to do and I presented whatever the subject was from a Christian worldview but when they went to the next class it, it did seem to be the same thing and sometimes students would say things like why are you giving me a bible study during my Indonesian class when I was trying to bring across a Christian worldview. Mm. So it made me wonder what was happening in other classrooms. Added to that, when I became a mom um, and I'd visit, you know, kindy or pre-primary classes, I just saw how enthusiastic all the students were to learn. And by the time they came to me in high school, they were so disengaged. And I thought, what happened to that love of learning? And it's interesting because in recent years, when I have said this to my teacher friends who are teaching kindy and pre-primary early childhood, they've said that they have students now at that age, four and five, who hate school. You know, so what's happening? Mm -hmm. So that you know made me wonder. Um, but I still believe that uh, you could teach a Christian worldview using the national curriculum. So I put all my energy into it, and I I sort of say always that I taught by faith meaning I never saw the results. I just believe that one day it'll click to these kids that'll happen. And, you know, God is gracious. I have, you know, every now and then in my 30 years of teaching, the odd student would come up to me and said, oh, you said such a such a thing. And I'm like, I don't even remember saying it. Mm. But, you know, God used that to touch earth life. So. Mm. so tell us about, about the history. This is where it gets interesting. Tell us about the history of the uh, it's often called a liberal arts education, but a classical education. And then obviously Christians have, have adopted parts of that. Tell us a bit about the history of okay. classical Christian education. Okay. So if we just look at education and the history of education as such, um, different cultures have always taken up education as something that was important. So if you take the Romans, for instance, you know, during their heyday, they would decide beforehand, you know, who was going to be doing what job and train them. Um, and it is very military-like, you know, you are either in the military uh, and you were a liberated person, that's how the word liberal arts came, or you were a slave, that's about the only choice. And then we have the Jews who, you know, the Bible's important, so the Old Testament was taught, and so boys would learn um, what was happening. And then um, we have um, the time when education was only available to the elite, the rich who could afford it. And so the tutors would come to the house and um, mostly it was boys who got tutored by teachers. Um, and something that struck me recently was um, we talk a lot about Martin Luther and especially, you know, it's October. So we remember the 31st of October. What we don't realize that he was not just a reformer, but he had a great impact on education. In fact, he started schools for girls and boys. Um, and of course, in those days, classical education was the only education that there was. And he said that every boy and girl needed to learn to read because the, they needed to read the Bible. But they also needed to know what is happening in the world so that they could serve God and their fellow man here on earth. So it's very interesting that even at that time, it was churches that were starting schools. And of course, because it was churches starting school, God was very much uh, up front and center. 
then over time, one of the things that happened was um, we started having uh, laws passed where children were not allowed to go to work, which is a great law. But then what do you do with all these children? They're running around the streets as such. And so that's when this government stepped in and started introducing schools. But of course, they had an agenda. And the agenda for them was to prepare students, children for the workforce, even from a very early age. So, and of course that, you know, is like 150 years ago. And over the years, it has, dare I say, deteriorated even further. And it's become more and more individualistic, more and more for the good of the society, as they say. Um, and yeah, so I think that's in a nutshell, the history of yeah. education. Okay, that's the history of education. What about, so the history of classical, how it's evolved, and okay. obviously we can talk through that. So yeah. there is a model here that we see on the screen that talks about there's a combination of virtue and the, the, the classical approach and the curriculum that's yeah. exactly taught. Tell us a bit about how that works sure. together as a model. Okay, so the classical education of, let's say, the 16th century is not quite the same as the classical education of the 21st century, okay? So, but there are lots of similarities and the similarities would include uh, the reading of great books. So when we talk about great books, what we mean is books that have been written and have gone through the test of time. And they are books that have been written with the goal of nourishing the soul, uh, not to entertain, they're not the latest fad. Um, and so a lot of the content is written from that perspective. And then it's not just filling the mind with information, but to develop the character. So that's what the virtue comes in. Okay. And then, of course, the approach is very much depending on the age of the child. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the way a primary age child learns is different from the way a secondary age child. So all this together has been put together and has been used over the centuries and modified. But in the last 150 years, almost discarded. Um, and so education is what we call progressive education nowadays. Um, and they've di just ditched classical as the norm. Mm, okay. So what's the difference between progressive and classical in, in a summary sentence? What's the okay. major difference? All right. I would think that the goal of progressive education is to prepare one for the workforce, mm -hmm. whereas a classical education would be to nourish the soul. Okay. So virtue being the most primary and foundational yes. thing, yeah. we're building a soul foundation. And if the soul is right, then the child will develop its own Correct. love for yes. learning yes. and uh, interest and, you know, yeah. 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 So the books, yeah. So the things. books that are chosen, the resources that are used have that as a goal. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So very specific books and, and videos and resources. So, we covered this a little bit before in a previous conversation, but the trivium. So let's go through what this means. So this is then the educational model um, in terms of the method. So I used the term is the method. So um, run me through what this is all about. And okay. my, viewers may not be able to see it very well, but we've got the trivium here, rhetoric, dialectic, and grammar. And those um, work together through all the different. So, so let's start with the stage. grammar. Yeah. yeah. So when we start with the grammar, think primary school. Yeah. Okay. So grammar meaning foundational. So we do it's lots of lots of reading and spelling and grammar. Um, yeah, making sure that the foundation is strong. Then even if you take math, for instance, there is a language for math. So it's not just numbers mm. and adding numbers. Okay, so it's building that foundation for all the subjects. Okay, right. then in dialectic or logic, yeah. it's more of um, middle school or early secondary, yeah. where they've had that good foundation, but now they have to think about it and form a good opinion, a logical a reasoning. Yeah. And then uh, rhetoric is when they actually produce, whether it is written, or oral. Now, this does not mean that when a child is a primary child, that they never speak yeah. or never write. Okay. But um, in rhetoric, it's almost assumed that they've done the other two. Right. So now they're ready yeah. to produce. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then putting those together is the idea of that you'll master 
the particular pursuit that that child really, really is looking at in yeah. terms of, and in, in the way you deliver classical education, for example, you, you, you're catering to whatever the child's interest may be and they'll select from various things in upper stages. In the very end stage, end stage yes, yeah. in the very end stage. So before that, we expose them to lots of good things, yeah. put it that way, whether it's good literature or good books or anything that is wholesome and tried and tested. Right. Um, so that when they make a choice, they make a choice from knowledge, mm. not just out of emptiness. Right. Okay. Um, tell us why we go through, why do we teach Latin? And tell us about, about the curriculum that you've chosen to, to go through in this. Sure. So um, Latin is considered a dead language because nobody alive uses it as their first language. Yeah. However, um, and it's interesting because the more I look into Latin and try to study, I am amazed at how much of our English language, they say maybe even up to 70% comes from Latin. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's interesting, as an adult, when I look at words, when I look at a Latin word, oh, I can see why that is so in English. You know, maybe children don't understand, but we as adults pick it up much easier. Not only is it foundational for our own first language, English, but there is so much in the grammar and declensions that it really does gymnastics in your brain. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a bit like music in terms yes, of, of developing yeah. a language that Correct. develops critical reasoning. Yeah. Um, and so um, where, what we do in our micro school is all the way through uh, primary school, we do Latin and the kids actually love it. Um, and I think when they can see that it's relevant, uh, Latin becomes such a great subject to learn. Yeah. And from there, of course, Latin... Um, is the basis for many Romance languages. And then any other language, you know, once you learn one language well, sorry, once you learn your second language well, then, you know, the third and the fourth aren't quite as difficult. To learn. Right, true, yes. And yeah, like, as I said, Latin being the base language for a lot of the Germo Roman yes. European yeah. languages, yeah. yeah. Like Spanish and Spanish, Italian. Italian. And, yes, yeah. yeah. So there's a curriculum mm. uh, goals, um, and we talked about the goals of curriculum. And you also have mentioned to me that you use a specific curriculum called Veritas Press. So mm. yeah. tell us a bit about the curriculum, tell us a bit about the curriculum that people can actually go and buy called Veritas Press. Yeah. Um, so we there is a lot of classical uh, material curriculum yeah. available, um, and they have most things in common. Why we like Veritas Press, it's like a one-stop shop. Yeah. They've got everything there and it is so simple to use. So all the subjects um, actually, except for the math, okay. okay, all the others are from Veritas Press and they are all written from a Christian worldview. Okay. okay? And the reason we use Singapore math, we use the Australianized version of Singapore math, which is called prime math, um, is because it's so word-based. Uh, often the kids nowadays, when they are younger, they just learn numbers. Yeah. Okay, one plus one is two. Whereas in the way we teach math, and it fits in well with the classical, is uh, yes, you know, here's one block and here's one block, two blocks. And then in equation, one plus one is two. But what if the story is you have one chocolate and I have one chocolate? How many chocolate bars do we have all together? Yeah. You know, that seems simple for us. Yeah. But for the child, it's still that next step. Yeah. in their thinking yeah. um so that's why we like veritas press and you can check it out you can buy it for yourself and it is american based um but it is very user friendly mm. so it covers uh, we just want to read out the different subjects we've got art and bible and geography and grammar and english and history various languages linguistics literature logic I'm talking about the, the maths model reading rhetoric and science. Yeah. And I think where the most unique ones in terms of what's additional to most curriculums is a rhetoric, yeah. specific in linguistics in terms of more primary foundational learning yeah. in that. And logic. And, and the logic part as well. Yeah. yeah. So that would be the most unique added mm. foundational aspect yes. to it. And then added uh, one that's not written here is something that they do 
um, in the logic stage. It's a subject called Omnibus. Yeah. Um, it's like a flagship for Veritas Press. Um, and it is a combination of history, theology, and literature. Yeah. So three subjects in one. And it looks at it from a primary source and a secondary source. So primary source meaning like our year sevens have read the epic of Gil Gilgamesh, for instance. Yeah. Okay. Um, and at the same time, they've gone through all the seven Narnia books. Mm. Okay. Um, so that is based from on the ancient world. Yeah. Then next year they will do the medieval, and then the following year they will do uh, modern, okay. and then that three year cycle will be repeated. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of talking about the epic of Gilgamesh, you know, you're not scared to look at extra biblica, no, um, ancient stories. This is a contemporary of the Genesis um stories yes. and it's written yeah. from a completely secular yeah. perspective yes. obviously but yeah. we're exploring history through the eyes not only of god's people but also people yes. who are not god's yeah. people yeah. yeah and i think um in case parents are concerned i always say to them you know they're going to look at all this in a safe environment with a person who loves their children yeah. loves the lord mm. and knows how to handle it yeah you know so i think our children Perhaps instead of being overprotected, they're actually quite prepared, more than prepared uh, to go out into the world after that. Hmm. All right. So uh, what's happening? So you've, you've joined a, a, a global um, uh, association together mm -hmm. called the um, Association of Classical Christian Schools. Yeah. And so your Coram Deo and your micro school network called Classical Christian Education mm -hmm. Plus. <clears throat> has joined up with this accredited association. Tell us about the size of that. Yeah. And then also now I've heard they've been doing research. We'll actually explore a bit about the research in a little bit, but yeah. so tell us a bit about that, okay. that association. All right. So if I can just start by saying, uh, we are a not-for-profit organization called CCEP, Classical Christian Education Perth. So um, on the left is our logo. So that's your logo. Yep, that's our logo. And um, what we did was we had to do all this paperwork um, and that's how we got our accreditation yeah. with ACCS. Um, we have some what we call micro schools. Um, some people call it micro churches because yeah. we are basically... And how many are yeah, there already? Uh, two this year. Hopefully yeah. a third one will open up next year. Um, and so we are part of ACCS. Um, and one of the things that is uh, good for us is people in Australia might be investigating classical education. Um, and if they find the website, we, you know, we are on their map. Yeah. So they have something like 400 schools yeah. around the world. Yeah. Um, and we are part of that too. So yeah. we get uh, benefits from them. Right. Yeah. And so the history of, of these classical Christian <clears throat> schools in terms of the modern movement okay. kind of started in like the early 90s, yes. late 80s kind yep. of thing, yep. similar to a lot of Christian schools here in, yes. in Australia. Yep. Um, and they've just kind of grown from the micro schools initially and now growing. Some of them are very yep. large schools yes. in America. Yep. So what happened was um, in the early 1990s, um, lots of classical schools, and most of them started in, Church halls, yeah. they just started as small beginnings. Um, and now they've grown into big, big schools. Um, and it's not only, it's not only in those schools that classical education is, there's a lot of homeschoolers too, who use a similar curriculum. Um, and I think they were dissatisfied with the way things were, and they wanted a different way of educating children, um, something that would really help the child not just academ <clears throat> academically, but also nurture the soul. Right. Yes, so the, uh, there's a good soil report, it's called. Um, so because um, this resurgence of classical education was in the 1990s, they've had graduates, um, and those graduates, the alumni, uh, were part of a study. And, you know, in a summary, Yes, they are academically better off, but not only academically, they are also more regular in going to churches. 
they practice their faith, they get they get involved in the community. And the one that surprises me and everybody is they also have lots more friends who don't have the same values as them. Right. You know, okay. so they're not in a bubble. Right. They're actually yeah. out there in the world. Yeah. So the survey asked for seven specific kind of areas yeah. and, and compared the classical Christian uh, school Christian schooled the secular schooled and, and the Christian, homeschooled and Christian schools too and Christian schools too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so there's four different Correct. comparison groups yes. yeah. on seven different outcomes yes yeah. and consistently yeah we saw that and every single one I mean we're talking about relatively lower numbers compared yeah. to every other grouping sure but it, they, were, they were well or on top yes. you know, like 20 yeah. percent yeah and, and, and if you want to yeah. read the 50 page report yeah so it's a, you're most welcome so it's to read it. yeah so yeah. it's there at that website classicaldifference.com slash good soil good good dash soil um and you can read about that and um and read through it and we're going to watch a video now that will cover some of what they what they're doing and this is only two and a half minutes and so we'll just pause for a moment. In 1994, the ACCS was founded by a handful of schools that offered a different kind of education, classical Christian education. Since then, member schools from the ACCS have graduated thousands of alumni from over 300 schools. In the late 2000s, CARDIS, an independent educational foundation, first fielded a survey among alumni of all types of schools between the ages of 23 and 42. The sociology department at the University of Notre Dame conducted the survey. This survey tracked the practices, beliefs, attitudes, and other outcomes of alumni from five types of schools, public, secular preparatory schools, Catholic, evangelical Protestant, and religious home schools. Notre Dame statistically isolated the results of the survey to those caused by the school as opposed to those caused by the family or the church. By 2019, the ACCS had enough graduates from which to draw a statistically valid sample and field the same survey through Notre Dame when Cardis fielded it again in the same year. The results show significant differences for alumni of ACCS schools. What classical education to me offers is not simply looking at college. They're looking at who the student is and who they become as an individual. It's a very candid, open conversation about what is good, honorable, and true and beautiful. The impact of classical education on my children has been most evident when I talk to them as opposed to their peers in the way they ask questions and the way they receive truth. I would offer that the most obvious distinction between the styles of education, if you take the most common one today, which is progressive and then classical. Progressive tends to take the newest fad and try to engage the student into entertaining them and having them enjoy the education. Whereas classical is not so much about the newest fad, but it's about developing the ability to think well, reason well, and speak well. One of the things that drew us to the classical education was the idea that it was a better education, that our children would return to the roots, so to speak, of how we should be educated and what we should learn. In reflecting on that, obviously the teachers have a massive impact as in you spend a lot of time in a school environment, um, but of course there is a place of parents and the church in terms of the church originally was involved in bringing mm -hmm. these kids that yeah. are no longer able to have a like the home duties or or the, uh, work a trade with their with their parents anymore weren't allowed to do that at a young age they had to go off to school get ready for that trade so it used to be that the parents were very heavily involved yeah. in education so what is the role of parents now yeah. in terms of making this work mm -hmm. and how big of what impact does it you know the parents you know education of their child actually have in, in some of these outcomes do you think yeah. um if i can just go back a step you know when jesus said that uh, we are to go out and make disciples of all nations that included children too yeah um and i think most people nowadays um maybe they think that this church can do it but you know spending 45 minutes in a sunday school class once a week um, in comparison to the hours that they might stay sit in a secular classroom um, you know just do the math yeah. um, but God has given us parents not just the responsibility but the privilege um, children are wet cement you know you can write on them 
uh, what a privilege that is that we have as parents to be able to mold <clears throat> um, but sometimes parents are busy and God has not said that parents are the only ones responsible. They have the ultimate responsibility, but they can share their responsibility with others. So the church comes in too, where the church has a responsibility because they have these children in their congregation to uh, educate them too. So we have the parents with the home and church. And then can you imagine if there was also schooling, if the three were all doing the same thing okay if there were three legs of a tripod and they were all strong usually one is strong and the others are you know it's a bit topsy-turvy or lopsided yeah. um and so we live in a time where people are very busy so they have to make a decision they have to decide what is a priority um and it's sad to say in the all the time that i've taught in christian schools even those students, when I've asked the question, what do you want to do after you finish school? It's, it is to go off and make lots of money. Mm. You know, money becomes the God yeah. that they're all serving, whether they're Christian or not. So I suppose um, I want to rise up. I want to encourage others to rise up and take up the challenge. Yes, it is difficult. But God has not given us um, nothing. You know, not only has he given us his word and his spirit, he has given us each other too. So we can work together and for the common good. Um, and isn't it interesting that schools were started by churches? Yeah. Um, and now just because the government gives money, I feel that churches have been happy to just sit down and let the, let the government run the schools. Um, and we see what the result is in the lives of our children, that you know, even our children need to be evangelized mm. because they are going to schools where they are taught, they're not taught the gospel, but they're taught another gospel. So I suppose um, what we are trying to do is we are trying to set up micro schools. We're not into making something bigger and a lot of parents send their kids to us because we are small. Uh, and because we are small, we know what's happening with the kids. You know, nobody can hide. Uh, whether it, that somebody's doing really well or really badly, the teacher knows immediately. And so the teacher can have a conversation with the parent immediately too. Yeah. Don't have to wait for a report. Just talk right now. Um, and so we have the opportunity to actually work well together. Um, and so we are not only building micro schools, but we're happy to work with churches and set up co-ops where if parents are happy to get together and educate their children together, then we are happy to come along and help. Yeah. So um, we've got time for questions now, I guess. So Andrew, you've been collecting some questions from our um, esteemed audience, and I'm wondering if you can direct some by our way. Yeah, look, I, I had a couple of questions to run by you. Um, from, from today, and my first question was, do parents who are homeschooling their children need any particular training in how to administer the kind of classical education that you're referring to? Uh, just like any other homeschooling, parents do not need to be trained. Um, and that's why I like Veritas, because you can just pick it up and have a go. Right. Um, for some parents, they can start off and it's not that difficult. I mean, you can even pick up the Latin book for your seven-year-old and you can sing the songs, even though you don't have a Latin background. Um, however, as they progress, if it is more and more difficult, well, talk to us and let us help you. Let us be an alternative. Don't think that the only other alternative you have it is, is to send them back to state schools. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 good. Thanks. I, I'm here in Australia. We, we do have a, quite a few options. There, there is, of course, the state system, which probably 70% of families do use throughout the community. And there's, well, as you would know, there's another... 20 or so percent, I'm just choosing my numbers very roughly here, who are in private, the private system. And then 
possibly moving towards 10 percent it might not be that many who are homeschooled but i and, and so there are lots of varieties with both with all of those and um so mm. thankfully there are options within the australian system mm. yeah and i i and they say that um the number of people who are taking their kids out of state schools is increasing yeah and since covid particularly the number of people who are homeschooling their children is increasing too. Oh yeah. 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 It's it's doubled in Queensland, amazingly, mm. in homeschooling and in every way I think it's up, up by a third at least. Okay. Yeah. So it's 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 grown very, very rapidly. Yeah. And I suppose the fear is always that the standard will drop. Um, and so we can say, like, you have to weigh the pros and cons. So maybe having a co-op where different people have different expertise, where you can have one teacher and uh, 50 kids because the parents are there too. Right. And maybe the parents are learning along. And so you don't have to be there five days a week, but perhaps, you know, you're there only two or three days and then you go home and do the rest. So mm. you're still homeschooling. Yeah. But yeah. with support. With support, yeah. So we need to think outside the box, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You had so another question, Andrew? Yeah, I do actually. I've got uh, someone has written in asking, "Do you have training for Christian teachers who teach in government schools, but want to upskill to help to help them gain employment back in Christian schools that teach with a liberal arts uh, pedagogy?" Okay, um, it's called classical U. U as in university. Right. I'm kind of hoping that at the end, you know, we can write some of these yes, websites out. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay? So classical U um, is, I'm sure it's not the only one, but that's the one that we use. Um, like if you were teaching with us in Coram Deo, that's what we use for professional development. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And um, they have, you know, something like 60 different courses and they're recorded and you get, it's certified. Hmm. Yeah. And how long does it take? Um, depends on how many courses you want to do. Okay. So yeah. it's an all sorts of things. It's not a fixed course, okay. put it that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice. Um, I know that at least there is one in uh, Brisbane called Christian Heritage College. Okay. They have a liberal arts diploma. Um, so it's not uh, how to teach. So you either get a diploma in liberal arts um, and you get a master's of teaching. So it's two separate things. Is that is that's remote learning as well? We can do yes, that. you yeah. can do that remotely too. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Very good. So yeah. Second question. Um, what resources are available in regional New South Wales? The, the person is saying, we're juggling therapies with a special needs child. We're homeschooling already. Um, I can only tell you what I do know. Um, in there's a another curriculum called Memoria Press. Yep. And on, in Memoria Press, they have resources for children with special needs. Wow. Okay. That's good. Useful. Yeah. Good. Um, is there any other types of curriculums that you recommend that could be good to augment for like people who are homeschooling as well? Um, I personally, my family, we use the good and the beautiful. Yeah. That's really good, certainly for younger years, all the yep. way through primary school. Um, is there any other curriculums that you're aware of that you think your parents should have a look at? Um, I think that you can get very lost. That's true. <laughs> because there's there are just lot. so much. But, but in terms of, yeah. I know there's so many, yeah, so that's yeah. why, what's the most high quality ones okay, that you That's the say? one, I think the one that I've picked. <laughs> that one. Very tough very, very, very yeah. yeah. Um, and... I, I admit that when I have a need, I go to people who I trust, yeah. who have, you know, done their research. Um, and in my situation, there were two people who didn't know each other, who both said to me, you should use Veritas Press. Okay. So I tried it and I was sold on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're right. Some people think it's too difficult. Yeah. Um, but don't give up on classical education just because you find it difficult yeah. go outside the box and find yeah. a different way of doing it yeah yeah well, so we my questions? next question is this one how does socialization e.g kids making friends with other kids 
work in a micro school model. Okay. So, you know, um, whether you have um, 30 people or 300 people, you only have so many minutes during recess and lunch to have a conversation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in our micro school, we actually have children who socialize more than in mainstream. Okay. Because mainstream, you can be very lonely during recess and lunch. Yeah. Because you don't have friends. Yeah. Okay? yeah. But in a micro school, especially because the teachers, they're watching uh, and guiding, there's better chance that you will not be left right. to yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I, I would like to think that a micro school isn't as big as a school, but then it's not as small as a family either. Um, and the kids who come to our micro schools also still go off on their fifth day because we only do it for four days a week and they do sports with other groups various other activities so it's not that they don't socialize in fact I dare say they are better socialized because they know how to talk to adults right, yeah. and they know how to talk to kids of different age and how yeah. to look after the younger ones um, the other thing we do is um, it's called peace wise kids um, it's Australian, and it talks about resolving problems biblically. Um, and so we do that too. Um, and so any conflict that we have, it, we learn how to resolve it. Yeah, I've done the adult version of okay. that. Yeah, All right. conflict resolution yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two or three days of that. Yes, and you it's know what? Good. I'm still learning. <laughs> so we need to do it all the time and to admit to the kids that, you know, yes, we're doing this every year. We have to learn. Yeah, you're, you're right very much about in a micro school or homeschooling environment, the child, and that's the way schooling used to be, you have multiple grades all together in the same room and you'd have to interact with people of various ages and have yeah. to develop. So, of course, your rhetoric and logic skills mm. automatically rub off on each other all yeah. the time. Yes. Um, whereas in the one grade all together, mm. you're all progressing at yeah. the same relatively slow pace. Yeah. Um, mm. yeah. I don't know if anyone is truly homeschooled only in the home if that makes sense yeah, sure i find that more and more people look for other homeschooling families and do things together yeah, um, yeah. and it's interesting because now i have adults who say to me oh i was homeschooled and i think you know i never have guessed that you don't have two heads <laughs> <laughs> you know you seem quite normal <laughs> Uh, okay, good. Uh, someone else just asked me, um, a friend of mine, Graham, he says, the Christian shoemaker, this is a quote from Martin Luther, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on shoes, but by making good shoes, because God is interested in good craftsmanship. How would you explain this quote from Martin Luther in the context of classical Christian education? I think everything is to be done to the glory of God. Right. And I think in a classical Christian education, that comes across. Right. So Good. you could you could still, I mean, I think of someone like Shakespeare. He had a classical education. Then we have someone like Bach. He had a classical education. So it's not just one area. Yes. So it's variety of areas. So it doesn't prepare you for a job, but it's foundational for whatever you do. Yeah. So even... Um, you know, like I think of William Carey, who was a shoemaker, you know, right. um, and while he was doing his shoes, he had a map of the world and he's praying for the world. Yes. You know, so there are so everything can be done for the glory of God. Of course. I've just got a, a question from Alwyn who says, is CCE recognized in WA as an alternative curriculum? I'm thinking for registration purposes. We are not a registered school. Right. Okay. We are, uh, but what we are is we are there to support homeschooling families. So the families right. that come to one of our micro schools, they are registered as homeschooling families. Right. So when the education department sends the moderator, they don't come and visit us, they go to the family. Right. Okay. Added to that, 
um, we say that there are some things we cannot do. We cannot do sport because we're so small. Yes. Um, when it comes to uh, health, we don't do the sex ed part. Right. Um, and we don't do IT. So okay. because parents already know this, they are actually doing that on their fifth day when they're home. Um, and so the moderator comes to see what they're doing and, you know, they're quite satisfied. I mean, this is, we started our pilot project in 2020 um, and from 2021, we've been doing it. So we've had moderators visit us, sorry, visit our families um, <clears throat> and they've been satisfied. Okay, great. So are there more Christian schools moving back to classical education? Okay. So um, they say that there are about seven schools in Australia um, that are heading that way right. or are doing bits of it. So I suppose the question is always, if someone says it's a classical school, the question is, what makes it classical? Is it sure. because they only do the literature part? Because you can be a classical school without being a classical Christian school. Right. Yeah. So I think, especially among our Catholic friends, they seem to be spearheading it, this movement. Okay. So... Um, did you... Uh, sorry, I forgot to say, is it Greg Sheridan, a couple of weeks ago, wrote an article in the Weekend Australian? Right. That is worth reading. Okay. Just covering what classical yes. education is. And what's happening in Australia. Oh, yeah. very good. I didn't see that one. Okay. Uh, I've got a question also from Graham where he said, is it important to discover and develop the interests and talents of students in the CCE schools, especially those who have no interest in Latin? I think... Um, the way you make a horse drink is sometimes you drop a salt tablet in the bucket and you cause a desire to drink. Right. Um, if I can just give you the example of a conversation I had with my five-year-old granddaughter last week, um, the word was N-O full stop. And she was reading it to me and she said, no. I said, no, it's number. And she said, why? <laughs> so of course, then I had to do my homework. And N-O full stop is short form for number because it's the word numeral, yeah. which is Latin. Yeah. So I think we can make it interesting, um, both as parents and as a teacher. Okay, good. Um, I used to teach um, Indonesian. <laughs> And every year I would get at least one kid who'd come up to me and say, now, how's this going to help me get a job? Okay. So in my five years of teaching Latin, I have never had that question from a child. Right. Next question is that uh, do micro schools have open days for inquirers to come and meet staff and view some of the work going on? And if so, how do we hear about them? Okay. So, um, we don't have an open day per se, but our doors are always open. So for instance, right. tomorrow here in Perth, um, I have a family coming to visit us at 10 o'clock. So they just have to make an appointment with me and they come and visit, they hang around for an hour or so. If the child is a bit older, they have the option of actually spending half a day or a day with us because it is different to mainstream schools. So that's right. how we do it. So, so does a micro school day look like a typical school day, the same sorts of hours with, with the recess and lunch? And how does it differ apart from only being four days instead of five? Um, a typical day for us in the mornings, let's, um, I'm only talking about the primaries, let's say, um, we would do Bible. Um, we would do the everyday subjects in the morning, let's say. So that's Bible, history, Latin, all things maths and English, okay? Um, that we do every day. And then in the afternoon, we would do the once a week, science, geography, music, art. So I think um, 
the resources we use are different. Um, the way we teach the pedagogy is different. So for example, because young kids are so good at memorizing and remembering things, we do a lot of chants and singing. So they may not understand every Latin word, but they're singing a Latin song. They may not understand every part of the body, but they're singing a song. So it's foundational. That's what the grammar stage is. So that then when they go on to the logic stage, they understand it. Um, we don't have lectures. It's all Socratic discussions, even from young. Okay, it's basically sit around a table, we're talking. Um, yeah. So I think those are the ways that it is different from mainstream schools. And of course, um, we actually, the way we do things is we don't place a child in um, a level because that's their age. When a child comes, we work out what level they're at. We had a boy who came to us and um, you know how you write from right to left? He was writing from left to right and bottom to top. Um, he could read, but he could not tell me the alphabet from A to Z. And he'd been in mainstream schools for in kindy and pre-primary and grade one, actually. And so he was supposed to start in grade two. And these were all the problems he was facing. Um, so I chatted to his mom and I said, how would you feel if we tried him in a grade one level? And she was fine with that. Um, and so we did. And, you know, within nine months, I remember I had to do a relief that day. I went and sat with him and I watched him and lo and behold, that day the exercise was write the alphabet, A to Z, uppercase and lowercase. And he did all of it and the right way. You know, so he learned fast, but just being held back by a year. And I did talk to his mother. I said, do you want me to accelerate him to catch up? She said, no, <laughs> he's very happy, very satisfied. Let's not get more out of it. So I think we don't have to push the child into a box and say, well, you have to do this because different kids progress differently. Okay. So, so has your company or other companies written a classical education curriculum with an embedded Christian worldview that teachers can just pick up and teach? Um, we have not written the curriculum. We have bought it from right. Veritas Press. Right. Um, and so the two that I mentioned that we use, we use Veritas Press for um we call it pre-primary. I know the Eastern status call it kindy. <laughs> okay. So the year before yeah. school to year 12, we use Veritas Press mainly. Um, but for the four-year-olds, we use Memoria Press. Those are two. And then you said you use... Yeah, the good and the beautiful. Okay. That's, not, that's not classical, but okay. it's very much Christian-based okay. homeschooling right. yeah. curriculum. Yeah. yeah. So in the two that I mentioned, the Christian worldview is already embedded in it. So the teacher doesn't have to, as such, think about it. The teacher just has to know what she's talking about and go with it. And yes, you can get it from America yourself. And there yeah. are actually now, I find that um, Reformers Bookshop mm -hmm. has a whole section on homeschooling resources. Okay. So that's, a, that's another that's avenue. A, that's the best one. And there's also one over East as well, I think. Which one? I can't remember. There's another <laughs> Yeah, I think pretty sure there's another reformers book shop over in okay. as well. Okay. As well. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's all the questions I have. All right. Cool. Well, we're down at 2.53. So we're already spoken for 50 minutes. So it's been great. It's great to have the quick fire questions and people from our Family Voice uh, tribe um, asking some great questions. So thanks for your time today, Sheila. And Thank you. it's great to chat with you again. Um, yeah. If people want to find out more, obviously we covered classicaldifference.com and we can look at also so that you have a Facebook page where people can just follow Classical Christian Education Perth. Go to the website for Coram Deo which is coramdeo.org.au and obviously you have Instagram and, and YouTube and stuff like that. We've already done a podcast together which Family Voice audience can go and actually watch and that's you know half an hour where we cover some of the same ground but some different ground as well. And we just, you know, covered, you know, introducing the whole concept of a classical Christian education. So that's on the Family Voice website and on the Family Voice YouTube channel. 
if you go into our resources part of our website, you'll find uh, podcasts and there it's listed there as well as on our YouTube channel. So you can go and get more information. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to point out in terms of resources that parents would like to look into? Just, I think just look for it. It's there, mm. it's there. Um, and I just want to use this analogy to finish off. You know, if I was going for a walk and there was a little fire, I might gently knock at the door and say to you, um, you might want to check out that little fire there. Yeah. But if I was walking and there was a blazing fire, I'm going to really be loud about it and stomp the ground and say, hey, get out of there. I think education is in the latter now. And so we need to rise up, wake up to what's happening and look for an alternative. Right. Yeah. And they are available. Yeah, well, initially, just going into the discovery phase to find out, you know, what are the statistics? Go and talk to your own teacher at your school, talk, talk to your student, your, your child, find out, go and go on discovery and find out. Don't just believe whatever mm. we're telling you, is yeah. just go and discover and find yeah. out what are the facts and actually have a good conversation with your own child and find out how they're doing, what are they learning, check where they're actually mm. up to, you know. Yeah. Find out, you know, what do you think a child should know at this age? check if, they, if they're knowing that and also check what is their biblical knowledge what is mm. their world view christian knowledge yeah. and, and just go through it with your child together yeah i think yeah that's the responsibility of the parent yeah you're you're you are the primary caregiver yeah. the primary educator yeah. In, yeah. in every way i know that teachers obviously have this major role because of the hours that they give to it but the parent is the one that's ultimately yeah. responsible yeah. and there is hope yeah you know we have god on our side yeah there is absolutely hope. yeah so if you cry out to God, ask him for his yeah. help, he obviously always answer you yes. and give you the right resources, the right mm -hmm. people, the uh, a micro school network, whatever that may help yeah. you, you and your ch your children to flourish and to have a, a wonderful impact for life that mm. you can actually make a difference for Christ yeah. in the world. Yeah, which is obviously the hope of this whole idea is that mm. we'll be producing children that will have a positive difference impact yes. on our entire world and go out and make disciples themselves mm. and their children, we're going to raise their children and you know, yeah. it'll just keep on flowing from there. And it's, that's why you're saying that it's a fire in terms of how are our churches doing in terms mm. of our people, young people growing up? Mm. Are they coming to Christ? Are yeah. they going and making Christian homes themselves when they grow up. I mean, we're not necessarily seeing that everywhere. Mm. So we need to take stock and yeah. Yeah, look into it. Thanks again for your time, Dr. Sheila Nathan. And um, yeah, hopefully our family of voice audience really enjoyed today's webinar. We'll catch you again soon. Thanks, Andrew McCall, for your assistance today with all the questions and some very good questions too. Thanks, Daryl. Always a pleasure. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you again next time. And